Welcome to Zero Breast Cancer's Heart Health and Breast Cancer Webinar. I'm Katherine Thompson. I am the Science and Survivorship Program Director with Zero Breast Cancer. And I want to acknowledge that I am on traditional lands of the Ohlone peoples and that Zero Breast Cancer's offices are on Miwok lands. So Zero Breast Cancer has been around for 25 years and we focus on the many things that we can control that um, impact our risk of breast cancer and also our health and quality of life after a diagnosis. As you will see today, there are some actions that we can take to improve our own health. And there are other factors that require us to work together to address social problems, for example, unfair practices, unjust conditions that weaken the health of so many people. I hope that you will sign up for our not so very uh, frequent emails and so you can keep up with our efforts to improve health and wellness, to reduce risk of breast cancer and other cancers and to lessen the impact of that diagnosis. And one of the ways that we do this is by creating um, materials and, and campaigns in collaboration with scientists, clinicians, and communities. So we try to make sure that they are culturally appropriate and that they emphasize the things that we can do. Our English and Spanish fact sheets for breast cancer survivors are available to download for free from our website. Um, look for that link in the chat. And we also can provide print copies. So let us know if you are interested. We're creating a heart health and breast cancer fact sheet now, and it will be based on the blogs that are also in the chat. Um, thank you, Liana. Um, and you can sign up again for our email list to find out when that fact sheet will be available. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. So Dr. Uh, Sabir Tadani is a cardiologist at Kaiser Permanente South San Francisco and founder of the Kaiser Northern California Cardio-Oncology Pro Program. He's also an assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco or UCSF. Uh, Dr. Alexis Beatty is a cardiologist and health services researcher with an appointment in the cardiology division of UCSF's Department of Medicine, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and I have been very fortunate to be an advisor on one of her current projects. Uh, not only did Drs. Beatty and Tadani both study engineering, they did their advanced cardiac imaging fellowships together at UCSF. So, um, Samir, can you please go ahead and share your slides now and take it away? Great, thank you. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can't uh, see yours. Let's see. Hopefully you can see it now. Can you see it now? They're coming up. Okay, great. Uh, got it. Got it. Okay, <clears throat> good. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to be joining this group and um, was really glad for the invitation. Uh, so today I am discussing the intersection of heart disease and breast cancer and giving you my perspective on this as a clinical cardiologist. Um, you know, as Catherine mentioned, I, I'm based at Kaiser in South San Francisco and, uh, and developing a cardio-oncology program here. Um, and so I, as, as a clinician, I wanted to start out with a case example. Um, so this is a case of a 57-year-old uh, woman who I saw with a history of obesity and high blood pressure who was referred to our cardio-oncology clinic uh, during her uh, therapy for breast cancer. She had completed four cycles of chemotherapy with doxorubicin, as well as three months of trastuzumab or Herceptin of a planned 12-month uh, course. She was asymptomatic. However, her echo showed changes with a reduction in her heart function. And so this prompted the referral. And so uh, she was started on therapy. And so the, first and foremost, she was started on a couple of medications, carvedilol and lisinopril, which are both blood pressure medications, but also have significant uh, benefit to help the heart function better. Um, but in addition to medical therapy, uh, lifestyle changes were made. So she was transitioned um, from a very uh, meat-oriented diet to a mostly whole food, plant-based diet, low in sodium. Uh, she was also encouraged to increase physical activity to at least 30 minutes a day 
five days a week and, and, and did a really good job of, of complying with that. And so with, um, with time, uh, she was able to improve her heart function, uh, which got back to normal and continue with her therapy for, for breast cancer uh, and is, is still doing very well today. And so I use that uh, case to really um, <clears throat> to, to dive into the rest of the talk, which is uh, first discussing the scope of the problem, some of the risk factors and uh, ways to prevent uh, cardiac toxicity. Uh, discussing the chemotherapy related cardiac toxicity of two particular agents that are very commonly used in breast cancer. And then talking a little bit about prevention with a focus of the whole food plant-based diet, which is an area I'm interested in. Uh, in addition to being a, a general cardiologist, I have a strong interest in lifestyle medicine, and this is one of those areas that, that I feel very strongly about. Um, so what is the scope of the problem? So just taking a bigger picture of the intersection of cardiology and just oncology and cancer in general, not, not limited to breast cancer, uh, there are eight, projected to be 18 million cancer survivors growing to 22 million by 2030. Cancer patients are living longer, um, and so which increases the odds of developing cardiovascular disease, which tends to increase with age. And there are also many new therapies and targeted therapies, which is really exciting in terms of what can be done for um, helping and, and helping people survive uh, cancer, uh, improving outcomes. But unfortunately, there are more side effects, including cardiovascular side effects that come with these therapies. And so that requires more monitoring. And so looking at cardiovascular disease and cancer in women, uh, this, uh, this chart here shows the age ad adjusted mortality rates for coronary heart disease, or you can think of it as just cardi cardiac disease, stroke, lung cancer, and breast cancer. And as you can see, um, there are differences in population. So NH white is non-Hispanic white, NH black, non-Hispanic black, and then Hispanics. And so you could see the rates of each of these um, per 100,000 population. So, you know, significantly higher for coronary heart disease with, with variation based on race and ethnicity, um, a little less for stroke, and then uh, less for lung cancer. And then, the, you know, and then you see breast cancer. And so this, this gives you an idea in terms of the mortality rates um, between these different disease processes. <clears throat> And so what are the different types of toxicities? And so this is a very, um, there's a lot of information here on this slide. I just want to go over it in, in a high level. And so when we think about the heart, we think about the different parts of the heart. And, you know, I tell my patients, you know, think of the heart as a home, like, like your house. And so it's got an electrical system. It's got a plumbing system. It's got pumps. And so that's, that's how the heart works. And so uh, you have different components. You have valves, you have the arteries that go on top, and um, you have the electrical system keeping things running. And so the different therapies that we give patients with cancer can affect different parts of the heart. So they can affect the valves, they can affect the electrical system, they can cause what's called a cardiomyopathy or where the heart becomes weaker. Uh, they can cause atherosclerosis or blockages in the heart arteries vasospasm or, or changes to those arteries, um, changes to the pericardium, which is the sac that you know, is around the heart. And so underneath each of these are the different types of agents. And so there are many types of agents. Again, as I mentioned, anthracyclines are very commonly used for breast cancer, um, as are HER2 and, uh, inhibitors and so, antibody inhibitors, and so such as uh, Herceptin. And then uh, radiation therapy is often given to uh, people with breast cancer, and that can cause a lot of effects as well, including valve disease, uh, blockages in the arteries, changes to the uh, sac around the heart, the pericardium. And so this is just meant to illustrate there, there are many types of ways that the therapies for, um, for cancer can affect the heart. And so that's why it's always important to be vigilant, particularly in patients with some risk factors, um, which we'll go over. Um, and it's, it's really a combination of different things. And so one, the therapies can affect the heart and cause you know, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, but cardiovascular disease itself can be a risk factor for cancer. And so the two things kind of go together uh, in terms of those risk factors. Uh, causing uh, one causing problems for the other. And so going to those risk factors, and so this here 
maps out some of the risk factors for cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. And then in the middle, you can see uh, that there's some commonality. So as you get older, um, depending on the type of diet, so again, a high, high fat diet, diet tends to be linked to both of those uh, family history of cancer, as well as cardiovascular disease, uh, increased alcohol intake, hormone replacement therapy can be associated with both. Uh, ob obesity can be associated with both lack of physical activity and then smoking. And so these, these tend to be the common risk factors that we see for both cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. And then there are other risk factors for each of these individually. Um, but I, I think keeping focus on this middle here is really important in terms of thinking about all the things. And, and a lot of this goes down to lifestyle. Again, the family history you can't change, but everything else, much of it is connected to lifestyle and, and what we can do uh, to, uh, to reduce that risk. And so anthracyclines, um, for example, doxorubicin, uh, these have been all around for a long time, uh, since the 1950s. It's called the red medicine. So if anyone um, who's received this, you'll, you'll know that the bag, that the medicine itself looks red. And it's very commonly used for breast cancer, also used for uh, lymphoma patients. And so there are different types of toxicity. So when you first get therapy, it can even be during the infusion or within a couple of days. Uh, this is less common, but can be seen. And so patients sometimes will report palpitations, uh, chest pain, uh, this can be seen. Um, <clears throat> more frequently, we tend to see it later. So sometimes what's called subacute, so within a year, and then even later than that. So as late as 10 to 20 years down the line. And again, one of the more common effects that we're looking for in terms of the heart is weakening the heart function or, or causing what's called a cardiomyopathy or heart failure where the heart gets weaker. And so that's, that's one of the things we really need to be vigilant about um, in terms of toxicity. And that toxicity goes up the higher the dose of the medication that patients receive. The other agent that uh, is very commonly used uh, in breast cancer is trastuzumab or Herceptin. Uh, which has been around for over 20 years, and it's really made a huge difference in terms of outcomes uh, of, of certain types of breast cancer. Uh, but in the, the initial trial, which was done over 20 years ago, or published over 20 years ago, they found that almost one quarter of the patients had some type of cardiac dysfunction, whether they were symptomatic or not. And as a result, trastuzumab, so Herceptin, had to be discontinued in almost 8 to 10% of the patients due to these side effects. And so that's a big problem if, if people are getting the therapy discontinued because of side effects. Um, the good news is some people were continued on it and they didn't see any uh, further deterioration of the cardiac function in most people. And then even better news is that those who started getting therapies uh, that help the heart, like the ones I mentioned in the case, carbidolol and lisinopril were, are two of the medications, but there are many others. Uh, people who start getting that standard medical therapy uh, get significantly better. And so what are some of the risk factors for cardiotoxicity from these agents? And so first and foremost, if you combine anthracyclines and Herceptin, either in the, like someone who's gotten anthracyclines first and then gets Herceptin, or if they're getting them together, that increases the risk of cardiotoxicity. And it gets higher based on the higher doses of doxorubicin. So I, the number here is 250 milligrams per meter squared. In general, um, oncologists try to keep the dose less than that, uh, but anyone who gets more than that is at higher risk. If people have pre-existing heart conditions, so if they've had a heart failure before, if they've had uh, coronary artery disease, so blockages in their arteries, atrial fibrillation, which is type of irregular heart rhythm, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and then other risk factors such as diabetes, obesity, kidney disease, uh, as well as older age. And then black race is also associated with cardiotoxicity. And so <clears throat> there are parameters uh, put out by the FDA that if the heart function uh, becomes reduced, then the drug has to be held and you have to very carefully follow it. And the way we follow it is with echo, ultrasounds of the heart to look at the heart function. And so ordinarily people on Herceptin are getting ultrasounds of the heart every three months while on therapy. And then um, frequently after completing therapy, 
uh, they get a few more echoes. And so, but if there is any change in the heart function, then it's even more frequent echoes, uh, as well as the medical therapy that they're going to get. And so, so yeah. just a warning, your time's about up. Okay, so just last couple of slides on prevention on the whole food plant-based diet, which is again, something I feel very strongly about. And uh, these are uh, this type of diet has been shown to have significant benefit for cardiovascular disease as well as cancer. And so this type of diet is uh, comes from plant, includes vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, and fruit, and, and really ideally no animal products and a small amount of healthy fats. And so again, this, this really uh, is better uh, for the body, better for the environment as well. Um, but more importantly, it gives you more vital nutrients. And as a result, you see more antioxidant properties and then more fiber and other things that are really gonna be uh, nourishing for the body and help prevent disease. And so, uh, and I think we'll get into some of that a little bit more um, during the discussion, but thank you so much. Thank you, Samir. And um, Alexis, can you go ahead and um, pull up your slides? Can everyone see it? Yes, great. thank you. Great, thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm really glad to be uh, participating in this webinar today and presenting to this group on uh, a program called Cardiac Rehabilitation for Breast Cancer Survivors. And I'll just tell you a little bit more about myself. So um, I was born and raised in California. Um, I uh, did study biomedical engineering, did uh, internal medicine residency uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and my cardiology fellowship at UCSF. In my clinical practice, I see general cardiology patients. And in my research, I study new delivery models for cardiac rehabilitation and uh, digital health. And in my personal life, I recently completed uh, treatment for breast cancer myself. And I spend a lot of my free time um, with my seven-year-old daughter pictured here. And so kind of building off of what Samir just talked about, um, we also know that a lot of research suggests that exercise and lifestyle programs can help breast cancer patients. They can help them to improve exercise capacity, improve patient recorded outcomes like quality of life. And there's even the possibility um, that these types of programs can lower risk of cardiovascular events and improve cardiovascular risk factors. And in the cardiology world, we have a program called cardiac rehabilitation. And this program is a multi-component program um, that includes uh, five main health behaviors. And they are physical activity, healthy eating, tobacco cessation, medication adherence, and psychosocial wellness. These programs are traditionally held at cardiac rehabilitation centers and often include group exercise and group activities. And through a lot of research, we know that cardiac rehabilitation is very beneficial. So for patients with coronary heart disease, it reduces cardiovascular mortality, the risk of dying from heart disease by about 26%. It reduces hospitalizations by about 18 to 30% and it improves quality of life. And so we had the question, can we translate cardiac rehabilitation to breast cancer survivors? And so um, the work that we do, including work that uh, Catherine uh, graciously helps us with, um, is a new program that we're tentatively calling Heart Act, as long as our, um, our patient and stakeholders are, agree with this, uh, this name, but Heart Act, which stands for Heart Health After Cancer Treatment. And we're conducting this research in breast cancer survivors at San Francisco General Hospital. And this is a multi-phase project that started in 2022. And phase one, which is the current project, um, includes uh, what we call formative research. And we're doing interviews with 30 people at San Francisco General um, to ask them about their experience with cancer and recovery after cancer, 
um, and to ask them their perspective on translating a program like cardiac rehabilitation for the breast cancer population. And then now that we've completed these 30 interviews with participants, we're, uh, we've developed the outline of a program, and we're now sharing that outline of the program with additional participants in what we call human-centered design sessions. And so we go through um, the program step by step and ask people for their perspective um, on the various aspects of the program. Um, and we're doing this in a way that we hope will be relevant to the population at San Francisco General Hospital and relevant to diverse populations more broadly. And to do that, we're conducting all of our interviews and recruiting participants um, who speak three languages, including English, Spanish, and Cantonese. And phase two of our project will be starting next year. Um, this will be where we pilot a 12-week intervention, um, and we're aiming to enroll about 50 people in that study. And the principles of our research um, and the program that we seek to develop are that the um, program um, is individualized. Cardiac rehabilitation is an individualized program um, that seeks to do an assessment goal and plan for uh, every participant. And uh, we also want this to address health behaviors that people can actually manage. You know, if I tell you to, um, to get your blood pressure under control, that's kind of a hard thing to do unless you know that you need to do um, certain health behaviors to help get your blood pressure under control, like being active um, and eating right, um, quitting smoking, and taking your medications. And we also seek to meet patients where they are um, because we know that change and lifestyle change can often be hard. And so we need, we need to meet people where they are. So next I'm gonna share with you a few quotations um, that we've had from um, patients who have been participating in our research. Um, so one of our patients said, after I become aware of the benefits of exercise, I feel that it's quite beneficial to physical and mental health, and my body health has also improved. Previously, I didn't do exercise. After doing exercise, it helps me a lot. Um, but we also hear some concerns um, from some of our patients, um, and these concerns also help to inform how we develop the program. Um, so one participant shared that not everyone can withstand such exercise. It varies from person to person. I have worry too. Some people aren't suitable for such exercises. If they do exercise with difficulty, then something wrong will happen to their body. And we also hear, in addition to physical activity, a lot of interest in learning more about nutrition. Um, one patient shared, I do my best to eat right, and I know I had a pretty good idea of what is bad for us and what isn't. And I've seen the list of cancer-causing foods, donuts, french fries, bacon, cookies, and I enjoy cooking. So it just uh, exploring recipes, techniques of healthy food that would be enjoyable, and learning how to feed myself properly. That's essential to healing. And so through these interviews with patients, um, we've kind of developed a consensus of, um, of what seems to be important to people. And so one is that we do believe that a multidisciplinary and multi-component program is both needed and wanted. Um, and then we've also learned a number of things about the structure and delivery of the program. Um, a lot of our patients prefer in-person sessions um, and group sessions, but for some, the Zoom and virtual option has a lot more convenience. Um, people do want to hear from professional speakers. Um, people hope to have um, their uh, program delivered in a language concordant way. Um, and uh, people also express a need for support for overcoming barriers. Um, for instance, we've had um, some suggestions for providing taxi vouchers to help people get to and from exercise sessions. Um, and on the content aspect, I think we're coalescing around a number of topics, including physical activity, nutrition, mental well-being, cardiovascular risk factors, survivorship, and then other topics as they come up for individuals. Other key things that I wanted to point out from what we've learned, um, there's a strong desire for the physical act activity and exercise to be part of people's daily lives. Um, and something that they can incorporate as a routine. 
Um, and then people very much want us to address any limitations and safety. Um, and there is a fear of doing too much or being too strenuous um, during a recovery period. And interestingly, this is something that comes up in our cardiovascular disease population as well, um, and something that cardiac rehab is actually very effective at addressing. And then uh, for the nutrition, we've gotten a lot of great suggestions from patients, um, most of which are around making our education on nutrition very practical by including things like recipes and shopping lists. And so from this, we've developed an overall patient journey map um, that starts at referral into our program um, from usually from the oncology clinic, but patients also recognize that they could be referred from their primary care doctor through organizations in the community or through things like flyers. Um, people will come in and have an individualized patient intake where they talk about their health and developed an individualized plan um, with goals and actions. Um, and then people come in and participate both in group and individual sessions over the course of 12 weeks. Um, the group sessions will be group education sessions, and then the individual sessions will be individual counseling sessions with our nurse. And these sessions could, could occur both in person or virtually over Zoom or over the telephone. And then people will be exercising on their own. People can exercise on their own at home or in the community, or we're also going to open up the um, rehabilitation gym at San Francisco General Hospital um, for group exercise sessions for participants in the program. And then finally, after completing the program, people get to graduate to have that sense of accomplishment and to see how much that they've improved um, in terms of their exercise capacity and other measures. And the program components that we'll be focusing on are physical activity, nutrition, mental wellness, cardiovascular risk, survivorship, and other topics that may come up for, um, for participants, such as tobacco cessation or um, concerns about um, body image um, after cancer treatment. And then each of these items, um, the participant in the program will have an individualized assessment goal and plan. And so our next steps for the program are to complete our human-centered design sessions, which will be happening later on this year. Um, and then starting in 2023, we will get into phase two of our project, which will be a pilot study of the 12-week program in 50 patients at San Francisco General Hospital. And I'm happy to take any questions about the program um, or in general about applying lifestyle uh, programs like cardiac rehabilitation to breast cancer survivors. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alexis. And um, also thank you so much, uh, Samir, uh, for those excellent presentations. I want to go ahead and introduce now our other two. Oh, I... Sorry, need to get back to the correct um, slide. I want to introduce our other panelists who are gonna be joining us. We're very excited to have with us um, two amazing women who are um, working on breast cancer uh, issues. Um, we have, oh, and please keep entering your questions into the Q&A function. We also have a few questions that were asked during the registration, um, but we look forward to getting more questions from you. So um, I don't know if you can, oh, I think you're probably, are you seeing the right slide? No, you're not. Um, sorry, I'm ha having a little technical difficulty getting to the right slide to show the nice pictures of our um, of our um, panelists. Um, can you see the slides now, Leanna? They're not visible. Do you want me to bring them up? Um, sure, if you would, please. Thank you. Just a minute. Okay, thanks. Um, so we um, are very happy to have with us uh, two other people who are um, 
going to be pictured very soon. Dr. Marilyn Kwan is a research scientist with Kaiser Permanente, Northern California Department of Research. She has been working on the Pathways Breast Cancer Survivorship Study since its inception. And I am um, very uh, happy to be a uh, part of that project. Um, Joanna Hathaway is breast care coordinator. She helps people from diagnosis through treatment and beyond at Kaiser Permanente in San Rafael. And she also collaborates with Marilyn and me on the Pathways Community Advisory Board. So I wanna start out by asking Marilyn, if you, um, I know that you have a few slides to share and can you tell us a little bit about the research that you have been doing into cardiovascular disease and um, what that means for women with breast cancer? Give us a brief overview. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you, Catherine for the introduction and, uh, and I'm happy to be here today. Go ahead. Okay, so as uh, Catherine mentioned, uh, we um, are all united uh, in research um, under the pathway study. And um, the pathway study is a prospective study of uh, the pathways heart study, excuse me, is a prospective study of cardiovascular disease in, only, in almost uh, 15,000 female breast cancer survivors diagnosed at Kaiser Permanente Northern California from 2005 to 2013. Um, we matched uh, each breast cancer survivor to five women without a history of breast cancer on age uh, at the time of the diagnosis in the breast cancer patient and equivalent age in the um, woman without a history of breast cancer and um, also matching on their race and ethnicity. The overall goal of uh, our Pathways Heart Study is to examine the incidence of cardiovascular disease events in women with and without a history of breast cancer. And furthermore, where we are very um, interested in, uh, in exploring and laying out um, the details of how incidence varies by breast cancer treatment received and by uh, receipt of cardiovascular disease medications uh, in breast cancer survivors. So this work, uh, this study is funded by the National Cancer Institute. I'm uh, one of the multiple PIs along with my colleague, Heather Greenlee, who's at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center up in Seattle. So earlier this year, we were delighted to publish some findings um, from our Pathways Heart Study. And uh, here's just a very brief summary of, um, of our findings related to risk of uh, cardi cardiometabolic conditions, as well as um, uh, cardiovascular outcomes. So we reported um, that there was a higher incidence of hypertension and diabetes in women with breast cancer. In particular, within two years of the breast cancer diagnosis, there was uh, an elevated in increased incidence of, um, of uh, hypertension uh, that uh, seemed to, uh, to flatten after two years. Uh, similarly, um, diabetes, uh, there was an overall increased incidence um, within two years that actually then persisted up to 10 years after the diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh, interestingly, um, we did not find an elevated risk of uh, dyslipidemia, um, uh, these, uh, including um, lower levels of, uh, of higher levels of cholesterol and triglycerides. We found a decreased incidence over 10 years of follow-up. In our other publication, uh, we reported that um, receipt of chemotherapy, um, particularly as uh, as uh, Samir reported on anthracyclines and trastuzumab, we found um, to two to, a two to three times higher risk of heart failure and cardio cardiomyopathy in women with breast cancer who receive these types of treatments compared with um, women without a history of breast cancer. And finally, I wanted to mention this uh, collaboration that we have with our colleagues at UCSF specifically um, Salma Sharif Marco and Scarlett Lynn Gomez. Uh, 
with, uh, with their collaboration, we have um, examined the impact of social and built neighborhood characteristics at the time of the breast cancer diagnosis on cardiovascular disease risk. Um, some of these um, neighborhood and social characteristics included racial and ethnic composition, socioeconomic status, population density, urbanization, crime, traffic density, uh, recreational facilities, and the retail food environment. So um, we were curious about what, what the influence of these factors would be in um, our 4,000 women uh, in the smaller pathway study. Uh, the pathway study was originally, um, uh, before the pathways heart study began, it was started back in 2005 and it's originated among 4,500 women uh, diagnosed with breast cancer at Kaiser Northern California. And um, subsequently, the heart study uh, came about um, uh, back in uh, 2016, 17. So restricted to just the women in pathways, we, uh, we found that, low, that neighborhoods with lower Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, composition had almost twofold higher increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Furthermore, we found that neighborhoods with higher crime rates had uh, 1.5 times higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So um, what have we learned so far from these findings, which uh, I have noted here on the manuscript is currently under review. Uh, we've learned uh, that indeed residential environments can potentially shape health outcomes. And while we're not exactly sure about the uh, mechanisms that are underlying these associations that we've seen, it's possible that stress pathways could be responsible for some of these health effects. So with that, I, I'm happy to answer further questions in the, the Q&A and I'll turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you so much. And, um, and I'm gonna try again to share my screen. Um, and if all we could have all of our panelists, please um, turn your cameras back on and we can, uh, oh, it did it again. It went back to the beginning. Ah. Okay. There we go. And so now we have, um, Dr. Kwan and Joanna Hathaway and um, Dr. Banani and Dr. Beatty. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question, if I might. Um, and actually, I'm going to just follow up on what you were just talking about, Marilyn. Um, so you said that the incidence rate of cardiovascular disease or um, is lower in areas where there's a more Asian American, a uh, higher proportion of Asian American Pacific Islander population. Um, do you have any idea uh, about why that could be? You know, uh, it is, uh, it's something that's very, very uh, interesting. Um, and we weren't, ex we weren't uh, expecting this finding, but it's definitely intriguing. I'd have to say we're not, um, it's, it's, we're unclear right now about what might be happening. Um, in our analysis, we, we did notice, we did note that um, populations of higher socioeconomic status that had lower, um, lower um, composition of Asian Americans actually also had, um, lower uh, had elevated risk of cardiovascular uh, disease. So um, it could be that, um, that uh, perhaps um, some other, it could be some socioeconomic related factors uh, at play here uh, in, these type, in these neighborhoods. Um, usually, um, neighborhoods um, in urban areas with higher um, Asian Americans, Asians represent more diversity. So um, we tried in our analysis to adjust for individual factors related to, um, to cardiovascular disease outcomes um, 
uh, levels of, you know, uh, related to physical activity, diet, um, body mass index, but um, these findings uh, did, did indeed still persist. So um, one other point I'd like to make is that um, we did notice that there, there was an intriguing paper uh, that, um, that found that neighborhoods, uh, that the cities with higher proportions of Asian Americans um, had lower rates of obesity, mental stress, and longer life expectancy than cities that um, with higher proportion of non-Hispanic whites. So again, it kind of uh, feeds into maybe some individual factors um, could be um, underlying these, this association where we observed. ask you since both um, both of our cardiologists and um, we I think we all know about the importance of some of those um, factors like exercise and physical activity nutrition etc so um, what are the um, questions that you get about staying healthy are those the things that you um, hear patients asking about when they're going through treatment yeah thank you um, I'll just start by saying thank you to all the researchers, researchers who presented today. It was really, really interesting for me. I don't live in a research world. Um, I was so delighted, Alexis, when you said there was such an emphasis on meeting patients where they are at, because that is the realm that I sit in. I meet patients where they're at and I work with them on diet and exercise and move them through treatment. Um, and I get so many questions about how to stay healthy before, um, during, and after treatment. Um, and I think specifically to your question, um, Catherine, what, what do I get? Well, in truth, I, I get it all. <laughs> um, people ask everything. Um, but what I, the, the point I think is so important is that cancer treatment and a cancer diagnosis itself is a really incredible, powerful, um, time to motivate change. Um, and I think it's less about telling people um, to eat healthy and to exercise because most people actually understand that. They know that in some corner of their mind that that's what they're supposed to do. It's really about working with them on how to do that, which is such a personal thing. And so for me, it's about having a lot of resources being willing to spend the time and energy to ask the questions that will help elicit where they are at with that. And also helping patients understand and patients and survivors and thrivers understand that um, they're not gonna feel like themselves during and after treatment. And that is incredibly frustrating and difficult um, and hard to cope with um, for our, our patients who are very fit before treatment, they have to deal with a whole new body. And for patients who aren't used to diet and exercise, it's something to learn on top of cancer treatment. And just acknowledging that they are a different person for it can be really meaningful and supportive. You're on mute, Catherine. I hope I answered your question. I know that was a little yeah. roundabout. Um, well, there's, it's such a big question, I think, that um, that's really important. And seeing the overlap between the things you were talking about and what Alexis was talking about with cardiac rehab was, is, you know, really telling. Um, specifically thinking about physical activity, uh, um, you know, there were the questions that Alexis was getting and her team are getting about you know, people being at risk, maybe they're frail. I heard about, you know, people being concerned about having falls and especially when they're older. So um, what kinds of physical activity do you recommend? Um, and I think that you shared some resources that we can um, share if Leanna would do so in our chat, but what do you recommend to yeah, folks you absolutely. see? Absolutely. Um, seated exercises can be great for anyone who is worried about falls or balance. Um, practicing balance is, of course, um, a great idea, but you want to do it safely and carefully. Um, and stretching and flexibility supports um, moving forward into more um, strength-based training. And so if 
where someone is at is seated stretches. That's a great place to start and it's a safe place to start. Um, and there are lots of online resources for seated classes and there's lots of online resources for stretching classes and seated stretching. Um, and, and those are always modifiable. And I'll jump in on this one too, because we, um, we, in our regular cardiac rehab program, um, especially during the pandemic, we've learned a lot about this concept of meeting people where they are, um, and then trying to design exercise programs for people that, um, that they can actually do. And so um, even though we want everybody to work up to meeting US physical activity guidelines of doing five times a week, 30 minutes each time, and two episodes of strength training, we recognize that for some people, just doing five minutes a day um, is a big change and can feel like a lot. And so often we'll do kind of a gradual progression with people as they, um, as they work into what their program is. And then for people who are already in the habit of exercise, you know, we work with them on building up their endurance and exercise tolerance so that they can do more and feel as good as they can feel. And in terms of exactly how that's done, you know, for some people, it's um, it's filling up water bottles and doing, you know, curls with water bottles. Um, for some people, it's doing push-ups on your stovetop. Um, for some people, it's you know, lifting your baby or your grandkid uh, <laughs> as as part of your uh, exercise regimen. Um, and um, people got really creative during the pandemic, whether it's doing you know, laps in your hallway um, or looking on YouTube for videos, um, like people, some of our patients even like dug up old Jane Fonda videos and we're having fun um, working out to those. So it's a lot of it's about finding what works for you and what appeals for you and then working on your, your plan to gradually build up. Yeah, that was going to ask about how you make that part of your daily routine. And um, those were some really great uh, suggestions for that. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, I want to uh, switch now over to the diet nutrition side of things. Um, and uh, Samir, I know that you didn't get a chance to really talk as much as you would have liked to about the, um, the whole foods plant-based diet, which um, we also have not only the resource that you had shared, but also a couple of others. So um, I'm going to see if I can share that. Would you mind talking a little bit more about what it is that you recommend? And then I'd love to hear from um, the rest of the panel too about um, your what you uh, are suggesting to folks that you work with. Sure, absolutely. And I think it goes back to the concept that we were talking about, meeting people where they are. And so um, <clears throat> so there's this ideal, quote unquote ideal, like um, where you you would really shift. There you go. This, this is kind of the tool I use um, to talk to my patients. And so it's called the plant-based healthy plate. And I usually like pull this up for pretty much every patient I see, like regardless, you know, if they're seeing me, um, this tends to be a helpful tool. And so I usually like start with and say, look, in, you know, ideally, like if you take, imagine your lunch plate, your dinner plate, um, think of it as like having half vegetables, you know, a quarter of it, like a plant-based protein, like beans or lentils or tofu, and a quarter of it, quarter of it whole grains. Um, you know, if you have white rice, shifting over to brown rice, you know, quinoa, et cetera. And so I, I, I present it as, look, this is um, a great goal to try to strive for. But if you're not anywhere close to this, then I think like trying to say that this is like what you need to do, like it is setting someone up to fail. And so what I basically try to do is say, look, what can you do to, to shift in this direction? Um, you know, I just saw a patient today and he's, um, he's got coronary artery disease, not, not a history of cancer. But, you know, his wife was with him and basically they said, look, he loves eating his steaks. And so I was like, okay, well, most people think of it as you have this big steak and you have a little bit of vegetable on the side, but what can we do to flip that? And so what about if you take, imagine in the middle of this plate and have like your little piece of steak there 
but then surrounded by all these other things. Like, what do you think about that? And so I sort of tried to talk about kind of shifting in this direction, whatever it takes. Like, it depends on where they are, right? So um, my own personal story, I was vegetarian for 20 some years and um but you can be really unhealthy as a vegetarian like you can have like processed foods you yeah there you go <laughs> like you could eat oreos technically oreos are vegan um and you could have lots of processed foods lots of like white rice like starchy type of things and so forth things that most people know that look are not going to be as nutritious um but what can you, and so for, but for me, then I shifted over to being mostly plant-based. And so that's an easier transition compared to someone who is mostly like animal products, trying to tell them like, okay, let's, let's try to get you to this healthy plate. So it's, it's trying to figure out what, um, what can be done to kind of move in that direction. And so that's, that's usually the discussion I have. And then, um, but it's often a process. So I, I try to start that discussion, give them the resources, um, there's a nutritionfacts.org, which is one of the links we're going to share. Is um, there's there's something called the Daily Dozen in that, where it's 12 things to try to get. There you go. Try to get every day. Um, so I usually show them this page because I find that if you tell someone don't eat this, that's harder to do. Like it's harder to comply with that as opposed to saying try to add these. Can you like? Do you think you can try to? like have some beans every day or berries like I go down the list and I say look whatever exercise right whether it's you know um like Alexis mentioned just even a few minutes or um trying to make sure you get enough water so basically incorporating these things and so that's usually the talk I give most of my patients and um and try to get them there but then it's a process and so like for me I'm, I'm lucky that we have a really strong health education department where able like I can refer to them and they can follow up as well in terms of uh trying to make sure patients are on, on a good path. And then uh, at, at a couple of the facilities, they have lifestyle medicine departments where they can actually follow these patients longitudinally, which I think is great. Great. Um, I would love to hear just um, if you have other things to add, Alexis, Joanna, Marilyn on this. Marilyn, you're unmuted. Did you want to add something? Oh, uh, no, just... Uh... Just one note on, on what Samir was talking about, lifestyle medicine. We do think there is a big program up in Sacramento uh, and um, there are some studies being run out of, um, I believe, yeah, South Sacramento and um, about a, a, a trial um, of lifestyle medicine, uh, whole food plant-based diet. Um, I think it's a, it's a telephone-based intervention. Um, Dr. Rajiv Mesquita is um, running that. And so um, it's, uh, I think it's been fairly successful. I, I'm not sure if the findings have been published, um, honestly, but uh, it's something that Kaiser Permanente, the, um, I think uh, Dr. Mesquita is a primary care physician. So he, um, uh, we, we're very cognizant from even the primary care level on um, practicing good lifestyle. And, uh, and building on Alexis's um, presentation, we'd love to uh, develop a study here at Kaiser um, uh, focused on breast cancer survivors and how we can, um, yeah, fold in cardiac rehab and lifestyle and to ensure that they live a healthy, long life post breast cancer. Wonderful. Um, there's one other topic that I would like to just take two minutes at most to address, and that is the need for that um, psychosocial support that you mentioned, Alexis. And Joanna, I know that you have support groups. Um, we, we have a few links about that as well. If, um, if Liana, would you put those in the chat? But um, Joanna, would you talk sure. a little about that? I will. I think a lot of people understand that treatment is really hard and we're just getting more and more research and information about how hard the post treatment time is. Um, and so um, I think getting support post treatment as a survivor and as a thriver um, can give you ideas about how to cope with changes you're trying to make in your life and also just the knowledge that like 
not necessarily everything goes back to the way it was before. And you're in good company with that. And I strongly recommend if there are any people in the group who are who are feeling like they could use that support, there are amazing resources in the Bay Area. Um, you are welcome to reach out to me if, to see if you're a good fit for my groups, but there are lots of nonprofit groups around, including the Bay Area Cancer Connections, which is in San Mateo, but their groups are all online, and Cancer Support Sonoma. Um, they also have fantastic support groups, um, and I have much longer lists than that, and I would be happy to share them. I also want to mention one of our sponsors today, Wellness Within in the Sacramento area has some great programs and, and I know that they work with the clinical facilities in the area, including Kaiser. Um, Alexis, do you want to add one minute? Um, oh, I do want to also mention, though, that I've heard from some people that they don't feel comfortable talking in groups. So we also offered an online tool, a mindset tool in the um, chat as well for those who prefer to have something that is um, not face-to-face -face with others. Yeah, I, I don't have a ton to add to what Joanna said. We certainly hear this from the patients that we're interviewing in our research and, and it um, and it does, it takes, as you mentioned, it's different forms for different people. Some people do want a group, but some people would prefer um, individual or one-on-one -on -one or, um, or working more within their family or community. Um, but the important thing is just to, to know that they are supported. And then one of the great things we are hearing from a lot of our interviews is just the, the sense of optimism um, that so many people have, and, and that is a really positive factor. And so we're working now on ways, you know, in people who are already optimistic to keep them optimistic, and then in people who maybe aren't optimistic yet to see if we can uh, foster or cultivate those um, those sort of like positive attitudes. So um, that's all. Great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I had several other questions. Um, and we will try to answer those via email with our, um, our wonderful panelists and make those available in a blog that we present. So thank you all for your insights. And um, I want to thank our sponsors as well. And finally, I want to make sure that folks know that uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. We do not send the most in October. We'll send one a week. Um, so if you um, sign up, then we you can keep up to date on the programs we are working on. And of course, social media. And please um, feel free to visit our website for our materials that we offer. Um, thank you all so much. And um, and thanks to everyone who stuck with us. Have a good day. Thank you.